Good afternoon, everyone. By way of a background, I'd like to give you a little bit of a context. Most people who have approached cancer immunotherapy today have not come from that field, but come from outside. This is a very hot area of uh, the field of research, and it's actually the oldest area of cancer research, stemming back to the 1800s, where the roots of cancer immunology uh, began with the father of cellular pathology, Rudy Verko, who first described cancer as an inflammation that was uh, aberrant and present uh, beyond the point at which a wound would heal. Uh, Verko, as you know, uh, was the father of the notion that disease starts in cells. And he was also the man who gave the first idea around cancer as a problem of inflammation and immune system. Subsequently, later in the 19th century, Paul Ehrlich was the first to enunciate the idea of immune surveillance, that the immune system could control cancer. And some of the early work done by Coley in the U.S. and others around the world showed that by manipulating the immune system with infectious agents, uh, using bacterial toxins basically, patients could show uh, effects on the immune system that were correlated with uh, cancer responses, uh, even the eradication of metastatic disease in some patients. So this aspect of cancer is very old. It was joined by other threads. The most dominant, uh, of course, became the thread that led to cancer genetics. The roots of that field in the 1900s came from studies of animal tumor viruses by Rouse, tissue culture studies later by Eagle, set of genetics by Noel, and Hungerford also at uh, Fox Chase. Uh, these studies became dominant uh, eventually, uh, starting around 1980 with the discovery of oncogenes. I think a big event uh, that is not widely appreciated that separated these two traditions uh, was in the 1970s with the discovery of immunodeficient animals, particularly the nude mouse, that could support the growth of human tumors within the mouse. This is a mouse that had an aberrant immune system to that extent, uh, it did not reject the human tissue. Uh, these mice were interesting partly because they don't have a higher incidence of spontaneous cancer on their own compared to normal mice. And the discoverers of these mice thought that was a very important uh, feature. And in fact, this became uh, the root of an argument that said the immune system was not important to cancer. You could destroy it in an animal to the degree that it wouldn't reject the human tissue. It would support uh, the growth of human tumors. This led to the xenograft tradition and discovery of new cancer drugs. Uh, and the thinking here was that uh, modern cancer researchers could ignore the immune system. And I call that the divorce, the separation of cancer genetics, which became dominant, of course, in our field starting about 1980. The cancer immunologists uh, were sort of sent into uh, the wilderness to some degree, and uh, this is a tradition that uh, continued. Uh, and it was not until really about 2000 when sophisticated knockout mutant animals were made that caused what I call the remarriage, the realization by the mainstream of the field that immunology is really important and that the immune system is an important suppressor of cancer, maybe one of the most important, if not the most important. And the nature of these experiments were from knockouts of the STAT transcription factors that mediate signals from interferons, also interferon knockouts, that showed that mice lacking these genes had very high rates of spontaneous cancer. The problem, of course, with the nude mouse is we didn't know about natural killer cells back then, which were still active in nude mice and maintained their uh, normal rates of spontaneous cancer. But it wasn't until 2000 that this remarriage brought the mainstream to the realization that we all had to pay attention to immunology. Over the last decade, there's been a conceptual synthesis, and it comes between the two different worlds uh, that uh, really were brought together, in part also by studies of inflammation. So those studying genes realized that in the tissue, if inflammatory signals weren't present, these uh, cancer-causing genes were rather impotent. And that was a realization that happened, uh, I would say, starting around 2000, uh, and dovetailed nicely with the demonstrations that the immune system is a key suppressor. So coming from two lines of work, the xenograft tradition, cancer genetics for targeted therapy, uh, we have uh, now modern cancer cell-centric therapy, uh, maybe added by uh, efforts to get at cancer stem cells today. And then we have host-centric therapy that's gotten a lift from the work on angiogenesis, but also more recently in immunology. And putting those two together is where immunochemotherapy comes in. The idea of treating the host immune system plus the existing treatments of uh, uh, chemotherapy and traditional uh, radiotherapy and surgery. What exactly is cancer? This is a, also an old idea that comes anew as a result of some of the new information you will hear about and become familiar with, not only the level of causality but treatment. 
Uh, our modern theory today, of course, is that the rogue cells of cancer are created by cancer-inducing molecules, and our modern therapies attack those molecules, for example, by attacking the EGF receptor uh, by Herbitex, for example. There is an established trend in attacking the microenvironment. This is now uh, part of the mainstream, and it's been demonstrated most dramatically, perhaps clinically, by the success of uh, attacking microenvironment and support molecules that have to do with angiogenesis, the attraction of a blood supply by a tumor. So anti-VEGF antibodies, uh, such as uh, Avastin, uh, do that. The new emerging idea, of course, which has taken the field by storm, I would say the last uh, uh, three to five years now, is the notion that uh, immunoscape licenses outgrowth of rogue cells. That all cancer cells must learn how, somehow, evolve the capability to uh, escape the immune system. And therapies that attack escape mechanisms to restore immune control can be effective. So the first example of this is, of course, anti-CTLA-4 or Yervoy, uh, the uh, antibody that uh, resets the self-non-self uh, tolerance uh, mechanisms in the body to restore what would otherwise be uh, a tolerance and a t to move to an attack on cancer. Now, the deep idea in immunology for over 100 years has really been that maybe the clinical phenomenon of cancer is more than just rogue cells, but rather a clinical problem of loss of control. Certainly by the age of 50, someone like me, uh, or even older as you get into men that are in their 60s and 70s, it's very easy to find prostate cancer. Uh, the notion that dormant cancers exist in the elderly at uh, uh, subclinical levels that are not found or only found uh, serendipitously during surgery for unrelated uh, 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 situations, that uh, the problem is not so much that you have cancer cells in you, but that your body has lost the ability to manage them and that cancer might arise from the problem of the loss of control, that that's the clinical phenomenon. That's the big idea at the root of immunotherapy. And marrying that to the attack of the rogue cells, which is what modern and established trends in our field do, is what immunochemotherapy is all about. Immunoscape, that concept, as part of the traits of cancer, popularized by this figure taken from uh, reviews by Hanahan and Weinberg over the years in cell. This is a new part of the pie, if you like. In 2000, when Hanahan and Weinberg first published this, uh, notion of uh, different traits of cancer that cancer cells must acquire. This was a part of the pie that was missing. As I say, it wasn't part of the mainstream. By 2010, it had become part of the mainstream. And it now appears that many of the mechanisms that license uh, the uh, escape from the immune system are also tied into metastasis invasion, angiogenesis, and metabolic. Now, the theory of uh, how immunoscape evolves in the tumor microenvironment has been if you like, attached as a veneer, a conceptual veneer, atop the dominant theory of cancer, which has to do with oncogenesis and the acquisition of mutated or misregulated genes. In that theory of oncogenesis, which is popularized by Bert Vogelstein and others uh, uh, in the late 80s and early 90s, the uh, normal cell is transformed to a more uh, cancerous state as a result of the acquisition of genetic mutations. Uh, also, epigenetic changes in that cell can transform it. The immune system, which is very sensitive to changes in structure of self, can detect those and eliminate them. But as a result of that selection, given the transformed plastic state of what might be a very small colony that's dynamic and regulated, uh, there is the possibility for evolution as a result of the selective pressure applied by the immune surveillance, the immune cells. That selection, which is a fundamental aspect of cancer and its main challenge, the selection for resistance, can lead to an equilibrium state where occult tumors may persist in a dynamic form that are, again, regulated but not uh, eliminated. This equilibrium state has been demonstrated in animals by Bob Schreiber, and uh, it correlates, uh, it's been suggested to the phenomenon of tumor dormancy, a clinical phenomenon that surgeons have noted for years. This was a controversial area itself until the late 1990s when it was shown that cured cancer patients could uh, still sustain cancers in their system uh, um, that were actually obtained uh, from uh, an organ transplant. Uh, so the organ transplant recipient would come down with a cancer. It could be shown genetically that that cancer actually came from the donor, even though the recipient had been cancer-free for 15 years after the transplant. So this notion of an occult tumor that can persist and be present but not be a clinical problem has been proven in humans as well as in mice now. With further iteration of selection for immune resistance, 
uh, various mechanisms that are selected, eventually you might achieve a state known as escape. And this would be the state at which the dynamic but dormant tumor uh, then uh, can begin to get on top of the host. Uh, gradually, the seesaw begins to tilt to such a state that it's possible for malignant cells to begin to accumulate and form a clinically detectable problem, initially locally, but ultimately in a disseminated form. The modifiers and microenvironment are very critical to the late stages of this process, the crosstalk between the setting of the tissue and the host, uh, genes that don't necessarily drive the disease so much as modify its outcome, the bandwidth on the Internet uh, information, if you like, as an analogy here. Those modifier genes and the microenvironment in which that tumor arises, especially its immune microenvironment, become the dominant aspects of whether the genes that started the story actually turn out to be that important late. Inflammation here has also been a field in which there has been uh, crosstalk and I think conceptual synthesis between different minds in the field. Again, the inflammatory microenvironment informs, in some cases, uh, what would be a chronic state into a, an acute state that uh, arises as a cancer. Not all inflammatory lesions, for example, in the GI may uh, arise to become colon cancer or another GI cancer, but uh, some do. And it turns out that animal studies suggest some of the genes that are affecting immune escape are the same as those that are programming the inflammatory state in these chronic inflammations that dictate what uh, becomes a cancer and what remains as a chronically inflamed but non-cancerous lesion. So the insights we're obtaining from the marriage of immunoediting, this new theory of how immune escape evolves, with the more traditional and established uh, uh, model of oncogenesis are leading us to these deeper insights that immunochemotherapy will take advantage of. So for those of you who are not in immunology, what is immunotherapy? Put shortly, it's those drugs or, or actions that would recruit the patient's natural immune system to fight disease. The most traditional uh, uh, immunotherapy uh, of the last century, one of the glories of science really, vaccination. Uh, in a vaccine, and vaccines have been developed for cancer as well, a foreign agent is introduced into the blood. Uh, this would be in the case of a tumor, a tumor antigen, and there are specialized cells that rove the body, uh, rather like tourists, and take pictures of what they see. They keep that antigen in hand and rove through the bloodstream until they come to a specialized lymphoid organ known as a lymph node in which lymphoid cells live, and this is where uh, you might think of as sort of a family gathering where pictures are shown and certain cells respond to those very strongly. A specific recognition of an antigen will lead to an activation of cells, T cells and other kinds of immune, adaptive immune cells, which then can rove into the body and destroy the, that foreign antigen, that foreign picture that was shown in vaccination. This has proved to be very effective at managing uh, infectious disease. Uh, there has been a great deal of historical effort to manage cancer in this fashion. Now, of course, these uh, vaccines uh, are given uh, to manage disease while the disease is present rather than prevent it, typically, in the history of cancer research, at least. But in considering the principles there in immunotherapy, uh, we've had uh, uh, cell-based as well as uh, uh, biologics that add capabilities, so active immune therapy, that would lead to the uh, uh, generation of T cell uh, uh, features, either by antigen presentation or direct introduction of uh, T cells that are activated by tumor antigens. Uh, we have passive immunotherapy. This has really been where the great success of the immunologic field has been in cancer research, the use of antibodies to attack cancerous molecules. And finally, we have Im immunomodulators, and these really modify the existing capabilities of the host. An example of this might be an inflammatory modulator, such as a COX-2 inhibitor. These are not affecting direct disease pathways, but rather the modifier pathways that influence whether the disease pathway produces an acute or a low-level, perhaps subclinical problem. So by this manner, the uh, immune system and, and, and through its manipulation by therapy, uh, um, immunotherapy can step on the gas, uh, affect the brake and clutch, or drive the steering wheel to direct the immune system in different ways and change its attitude toward foreignness, or as in the case of cancer antigens, things that are somewhat different but still look like a lot, uh, look uh, much like us. And uh, that is partly the challenge for cancer. How do we tailor immune therapy so that it attacks the foreignness of the tumor, but not so far that it attacks the body. And that is one of the challenges faced by the modern uh, um, immunotherapies, and you'll hear about that. So active immunotherapy has actually been around for over 100 years. I mentioned Coley's work with bacterial toxins. 
these have been modernized so that the toxin itself rather than the bacteria has now been studied in uh, uh, the last uh, decade or so by many uh, entities, many organizations. Uh, how, uh, how has it that this has uh, been such a, 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 a poor project? It really has been to the view of many, like myself, that uh, not understanding immunoscape was the uh, problem in the failures of active immunotherapy really to attract adherence. Uh, there are patients that respond historically that you've seen, but these have never been converted into large groups that could uh, be convincing and the trials have tended to have failed uh, or barely uh, been able to manage cancer. Partly that's because the tumor has erected in the host so many barriers has escaped uh, the ability of the immune system to modulate. When you're standing on the brake, it's very hard to get on the gas. Uh, supportive inflammations and T cell tolerance, treating the tumor as if it was the self, uh, these are the things that uh, have made uh, uh, active immune therapy fail. I'm going to now turn and tell you know, a little bit some of the most exciting work in the field that has really penetrated in the mainstream, especially on the clinical, uh, in the clinical sphere. And this takes advantage of what have been called checkpoint therapies uh, that activate T cell responses. As uh, many immunologists uh, uh, on the call may know, uh, APC or antigen presenting cells uh, talk to the immune system, activate T cell responses in two fashions by showing the antigen in a special context of a molecule called major histocompatibility uh, to T cell receptors that are specific for that. And as a result of that engagement, uh, they are potentially activatable if a second signal comes along that stimulates what are called co-stimulatory receptors, those two signals can trigger adaptive immune responses. The checkpoints are really co-regulatory receptors that do not engage the receptor in a positive fashion, but rather in a negative fashion. Uh, they tell the T cell, okay, you saw your antigen, but become tolerant to it. Don't become hostile to it. Uh, these immune checkpoint uh, uh, Molecules such as CTLA-4 uh, are uh, those that are, have been attacked by the early therapy. I want to say a little bit more about checkpoint molecules just to point out, again, uh, give you a, a better picture of what's going on uh, in this realm where there's so much activity in the field. Uh, the antigen presenting cell uh, providing a specific antigen that a T cell can recognize in a certain context that is influenced by positive and negative regulators from signal 2. Uh, there's a large variety of these, and as I mentioned, uh, a great deal of the work is going to involve uh, a focus on these uh, uh, molecules that are approved as targets for uh, immunotherapy. Uh, the immunotherapy of the future is going to have a lot of parts, a lot of moving parts. It's going to involve the destruction of the rogue tumor cells, the way we traditionally have done it with chemotherapy and radiotherapy. Uh, but also the way we do it now with targeted therapies that are personalized to the mutations in the cancer. But those will be combined with checkpoint pathway inhibitors, such as Yervoy or the PD-1 inhibitors. They will be combined with immunomodulators, such as IDO inhibitors or adenosine modifier, pathway modifiers. They will be uh, used in cooperation with adoptive cell therapies or vaccines. For example, in resected patients that receive adjuvant immunochemotherapy, uh, vaccination may help keep them out of the woods longer, and we'll hear from the vaccine uh, experts about how uh, prophylactic use as well as treatment uh, may be a part of future immunochemotherapy. So uh, with that, I think there's a lot of optimism for the future. This is uh, now the end of my presentation. Uh, I will entertain some questions from uh, the participants of the webinar, but uh, before we go to that, I'm going to hand off to my colleague uh, at ABCAM, Karen Sharma, who will give a short presentation from the sponsor. Karen. Thank you, Professor, for such a clear presentation. I'm sure that there will be plenty of interesting questions at the end. At this time, I would like to take just a few minutes to highlight products and resources that we hope will be of interest and that can help accelerate your research. ABCAM Simple Step ELISA kits are designed to improve workflow over traditional sandwich assays. Simple Step ELISAs use a proprietary technology that saves time and increases reproducibility of protein quantification by only requiring one wash step. The entire analysis is performed in under two hours, bringing this to 50% less assay time than the standard ELISA. A vast selection of human and mouse analytes can be quantified using the Simple Step ELISA platform. 
Below are a few human targets that may be of interest for researchers studying cancer pathways or the tumor microenvironment. Our list of simple cephalizas continues to grow, and to see what we currently have available, please visit us at www.abcam.com slash simplestep. Our tissue slides and tissue microarrays are useful for the identification and localization of RNA or protein in both normal or disease state tissue samples. Tissue slides are available for a range of disease states from various organs. Slides are available from a range of species, including human, mouse, and rat. Human fetal slides are also available. Slides are from formalin-fixed, paraffin-embedded samples and approximately 5 micrometers thick. Tissue microarrays containing up to 228 tissue samples per slide are also available, allowing high-throughput analysis of RNA, DNA, or protein expression. Our microarrays are also available from human, mouse, and rat tissues. Tissue arrays contain both disease states and control cores, with pathology and grading of cores available in protocol booklets. IHC control arrays are also available. All tissues are fixed in 10% neutral buffered formalin for 24 to 48 hours and cut fresh upon receipt of order. To learn more about these products, please visit www.abcam.com slash IHC. To help with your research, ABCAM has recently launched a collection of interactive pathways designed to help you find products which work together to elucidate a particular pathway. Below are just a few examples of the many interactive cancer pathways that can be found on our website. If you look at the T-cell activation interactive pathway in more detail, you can see the full signal transduction of T-cell activation starting from stimulation of the T-cell receptor by an antigen-presenting cell all the way to the appropriate immune response. If you would like to focus on a particular protein in the pathway, such as ZAP70, simply click on the protein in the diagram. This brings up a listing of the current ZAP70 products in our catalog that can then be categorized by the product type filter. ABCAM has a growing library of resources dedicated to cancer research. To view ABCAM's complete collection of interactive pathways, please visit us at www.abcam.com slash interactive pathways. To look for protocols, content, webinars, and literature, please visit us at www.abcam.com slash cancer. And if you'd like more information and resources on the tumor microenvironment, please visit www.abcam.com slash tumor micro. If you would like to learn more or refresh your knowledge on different types of techniques and applications, watch our archived webinars at any time that suits you with our online webinar library. This can be found at www.abcam.com slash webinars. Thank you. Thank you, George and Karan, for presenting today. Well, if you have any questions about what has been discussed in this webinar or have any technical inquiries, our scientific support team will be very happy to help you, and they can be contacted at technical at .com. We hope you have found this webinar informative and useful to your work, and we look forward to welcoming you to another webinar in the future. Thank you again for attending, and good luck with your research.